Welcome to the Gospel Liberty Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode. Hi. What is a winsomely reformed Baptist? What does that mean? Those are kind of interesting words to, to put together. Mm. Well, let, let's talk about that, and hopefully our souls will be encouraged and our minds will be educated, and mm. there'll be something for everyone in this episode. So a little bit about our story, how we came to believe the doctrines of grace, the, the, the doctrines of grace. Some folks call them the, the five points of Calvinism. I think the doctrines of grace is a, is an excellent, uh, phrase to, to use there. There's, mm-hmm. there's five major points. We're not going to go through the, through those right now, but me personally, I didn't believe in the doctrines of grace. I knew a little bit about it when I went into college, but not not a ton. And then I sat down at at Applebee's one night with some folks who were talking about Calvinism versus Arminianism. And I thought that I knew what I was talking about, even though I didn't. I had little <laughs> understanding of, of scripture. I just had a lot of thoughts in, in my own mind. And then this guy was coming who was a Calvinist and they said, Oh, you'll have to talk to him about this stuff. And yeah, that, yeah, that, that'll be great. And then I sat down with him, super humble person. He had his Bible open uh, right in front of him and everything that I was saying was just kind of coming from my own mind. Hmm. And then everything that he was saying, he was pointing back to the word. He said, oh, yeah, th- thanks so much for, for sharing. That's an interesting thought. What do you think about this text? in scripture. And then I would just come back with something and not say anything about, about the scripture. He, oh, okay. Thanks so much. What do you think about this text in scripture? Hmm. And that's how the Lord helped me to see that, you know, am I really thinking what mm-hmm. is biblical about these things? Or am I just coming up with my own thoughts hmm. from my own, uh, my own perspectives? Amen. And then I w- was introduced to a, a preacher who it was the first expositional preaching that I ever heard of someone actually preaching from the Bible and explaining the text of scripture. And he was talking about the the holiness of God. Hmm. And he, he liked, I went to his website and he liked John Piper Hmm. and John MacArthur. And I had heard of those guys and thought, you know, everyone had told me that they were bad at my Christian college, not (laughs) everyone, but a lot of people. And I thought, hey, wait a second. It tells a lot about that Christian college. It, it does. It does, exactly. <laughs> but then I started to you know, read some of those guys and, and listen to some of their stuff and was super encouraged. So then soon after, you and I, we became members at a church that was Baptist, that held to the doctrines of grace very unashamedly. Hmm. It was an excellent Christ-exalting church overall, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Yes. Oh, absolutely amazing. Wonderful, wonderful. What church. were some of the great things about it? Oh, I mean, I just, the, the community life was amazing and the preaching was amazing and just learning about delighting in Christ was amazing and um, just, yeah, being fed in a deeper way week in and week out was truly uh, life-changing. Being fed Christ and God's amen. glory was truly on display. Yes, Everyone really knew that we were here for the glory of God hmm. and that the glory of God was our delight. Yes. And it was all about the triune God. Yes. Yep. And his majesty and his fame. And that was good news for us. Yes. Uh, and we heard that every week in and out and it was hmm. the, the air that we breathed while we were part of that church. So it was an excellent christ exalting church, but it wasn't super consciously, historically rooted they they did have a long detailed confession of faith that the elders had to subscribe to which was excellent overall um but it wasn't there wasn't a ton of talk about uh, church history mm-hmm. or about uh you know older uh, confessions of faith and the the protestant reformation and and whatnot then we we ended up moving and we ended up at a church that was once again it was believers baptist it wasn't technically a baptist church but they believed in believers baptism and they this uh, this new church held to the doctrines of grace but but this church was a little bit more concerned with showing how they were rooted in the historical christian church so their hmm. statement of faith was the 1689 london baptist confession of faith that they had several exceptions to, to that confession, for those of you who are a little more theological, that the church held to a more progressive covenantalist position or a new covenant theology, it's sometimes called. And then that made them take issue with 
some of chapter 19 of the 1689 confession, if that means anything to you. Um, but, but, but the preacher, he had graduated from Westminster Seminary in mm-hmm. Philadelphia, and that's one of the most respected reformed seminaries mm-hmm. in the world. So by reformed, we're talking about the, the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century that most folks mark as beginning with Martin Luther posting the 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg chapel in 1517. Mm -hmm. And then that sparked the Protestant reformation. And then the reformed wing of the Protestant movement was kind of head headed unofficially by John Calvin. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then all of the different uh, folks that, that he discipled in Geneva and where they went out uh, to, to other places, John Knox, and then they influenced the Puritans, etc. So, so this Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, one of the most respected Reformed seminaries in the world, that that seminary is Presbyterian, and they hold to the, what's called the Westminster Standards mm-hmm. from the the 1600s, the, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Westminster Larger Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, are are the Westminster Standards. So at, at that time we were just being introduced to everything I talked about. You know, mm-hmm. maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? What are all these historical terms that you're, <laughs> well, why does it matter? Well, we'll, we'll get into that. But we started to learn more about church history and its importance in Christianity mm-hmm. because we hadn't been exposed to a ton of that before. No. Yeah. N- not exposed um, at all really. And, um, I think that this was very, very helpful and formative um, just to see the uh, the wonderfulness of studying history just in general too, just of course church history, but also history in general, um, I think is such a great, great way to learn and to grow and to just continue to study always. Um, it that, helps you to become I, a deeper person, yeah, yes, not I, as self-centered. Yeah, I, I don't think I... Um, fully understood the or grasped how amazing history was. Um, and this was a beautiful time to, to learn that on a deeper level. Yeah, it helps you to kind of get away from yourself mm-hmm. and to think about how the Lord is working in other nations, yes. in other peoples, yes. in other time periods, that you aren't the center of existence. And if you mm-hmm. think about where, you know, why there's such a downplaying of history in today's day and age, because the self is so emphasized and hmm. people are so, um, you know, millennials and uh, I, Jen, the, the folks after millennials, you know, I've just been swam in this culture of putting them at the center of the world mm-hmm. and your self-expression is the most important, is the most important thing of all. So you're never going to study history and you know, learn about other people from previous generations or other cultures from previous generations. Yeah, when, what's the point? What's it's, the it's point? Not, I mean, I just want to, you know, post about myself on Instagram <laughs> yeah. or, what, or whatever it is, right? So th- that was our first introduction to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, and through some research, we learned about this whole other world of uh, 1689 folks and and folks who call themselves Reformed Baptists. Hmm. And we, we studied the history of it, the, the present movement of it, and, and we came to develop a, a lot of great relationships with folks in those circles and even uh, eventually uh, uh, got exposure to Reformed Baptist Seminary and I what was able to, to go there and graduate from their incredible, amazing seminary. Uh, for uh, anyone who's interested in seminary to, to take a look at, I'll, I'll link it there. Great, great program, very affordable, flexible. Mm-hmm. Anyway, they're mm-hmm. not paying me to say that. <laughs> so l- let's start with a key question here. Why are we talking about this? We're, we're nine minutes in here. Why is this important? Well, like I said before, American evangelicalism, not only outside of not only outside of Christianity like we were talking about before, but American evangelicalism has a strong bent toward individualism. There can often be this me and my Bible attitude where folks just want to look at the the scriptures themselves only and come up mm-hmm. with all of these thoughts that they have about you know new theologies or a certain thing that they saw in scripture, but they haven't examined what anyone else thinks about that either mm-hmm. in today's age or in previous generations. Yes, amen. 
and then they're coming up with all of these wild, crazy theological viewpoints oh. because they don't have any respect for what's gone before them. It, it's extremely important as a Christian to understand and respect how the Lord has worked in past generations. Mm. So Ephesians four yeah. eleven through 12 says that God gave pastors and teachers to the church as a gift hmm. to help us to grow into maturity. But but these pastors and teachers have not only existed in your generation. There's been thousands of years of pastors and teachers wrestling with the scriptures and each other's viewpoints of the scriptures, sharpening one another, correcting potential uh, uh, cultural temptations, uh, correcting potential uh, generational temptations to err, and, and so on. Yeah, and I think so often people want to, you know, be unique. You know, invent they, something. They want to invent something new, and I want to do my own thing and not be like all these old people back then, or you know, oh, how they've done it for years. And so I think that that is also driving a ton um, why you know certain American evangelical churches might do things very you know strangely. Um, because they just want to do their own thing. Yeah, that's an excellent point because that is kind of the the spirit of the age yes. in our entire culture is the uniqueness of the self. Yes. So instead of wanting to, you know, um, be like other people in the sense of, you know, if you think about back to the 1920s, pretty much everyone was wearing the same clothes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most folks had the same hairstyle. Mm -hmm. And now it's everything I do, I want to be as unique as possible. <laughs> totally. I can't have my house look the same as this other person. That would be so horrible. I can't wear the same clothes as this other person. Mm -hmm. And the folks who get the most attention usually are the ones who are the most unique and who are doing the, the, uh, the most distinct things. So folks have taken that into Christianity. Yeah. That I don't want to just have the same theology that other people have. I can just you know go to my Bible by myself and get my own theology exactly and there's this c.s lewis used this phrase chronological snobbery and think about that chronological snobbery where you think that no matter if that the things that are the newest are the things that are the best so as time progresses as this a chronological time period advances mm -hmm then we just become snobbish to previous generations. I can't believe they used to think like that. You know, mm -hmm. we're so much more enlightened. We're so much better. That's not necessarily true about uh, theology and about mm -hmm. Christianity. Mm -hmm. There's ups and downs, and certain generations did things better than us. Totally. And we can learn from them. Think of the arrogance of not engaging with those who have studied the Bible before you. <laughs> That is so... I don't want to. No. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's so arrogant to think that just you and all you need is just yourself and your Bible and you don't care about what the, the, the fact that the Lord has given the same Bible to mm. millions of other Christians before totally. you. Tons of other pastors who have dedicated their lives to studying this and you don't mm. want to interact with them mm. at all or their thoughts at all. It's just you are smart enough, you are wise enough to separate yourself from all of those amazing gifts that the Lord has given. Oh, it's truly sad. I mean, people are just missing out um, when they when they don't see the joys of that. Yes, it, it's helpful to, do, to, to look back and to get involved with what other folks are, are thinking. It's helpful in, in your sharpening to know what you have in common with other professing Christians mm -hmm. and to know what's distinct. So that helps you to be exposed to more and then to, to be more confident that what you believe the scriptures are saying are in fact the truth on these secondary and tertiary doctrines because you've actually studied and been exposed to what other Christians have believed throughout mm -hmm. history. Yeah. So, so what is a winsomely reformed Baptist? Why do we call ourselves that? Why would we commend it to you? Well, what is winsomely reformed Baptist? Let, let's start with reformed. Like I said before, reformed is a, a branch of Protestantism. Reformed folks hold to the five solas of the Reformation. You know, that's sola, scriptura, scripture alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. 
And Reformed folks also hold to those doctrines of grace that, that I talked about before. You know, some folks summarize it as total depravity, right? That, that all people are mm. a, a totally depraved in the sense that we don't have any ability in ourselves to, to choose God or to do mm. anything righteous mm-hmm. without the Spirit of God first intervening and an unconditional election that God, based on no condition in ourselves, has elected his people who hmm. he's going to save from before the be, before time began and then some folks call it limited atonement um, which means that jesus when he was on the cross he actually had a certain people in mind that he was paying the the punishment for and his hmm. atonement mm-hmm. is uh, actually effective for those specific people to bring them to god and then irresistible grace that when god has decided to save someone that that person um, does not resist, cannot resist, because God gives that person a new heart, and that mm-hmm. person will willingly come come to God when he is uh, regenerated, mm-hmm. and that is something that is is not able to be resisted because God's grace is greater than our sin, and then perseverance of the saints. That once God saves someone, that uh, that person didn't. Uh, uh, earn his way into God's family. He can't sin his way out of God's family. Mm. That Christ's grip on that person is stronger than even um, than, than his grip on God would ever be. And Jesus doesn't lose any Christians. He doesn't mm. lose any of his sheep. These are such amazing. Oh, they're just so encouraging. Truths for your soul. Yes, Amen. It's not just some academic truth to to win a debate. It's it's amazing. And when you just think about you know one of those and study it and think about it and, you know, pray that it would you know, soak into your soul. It's just massively encouraging. And then obviously to go through all of them is, is wonderful. Yes. If you meditate on those truths, um, it's not some, once again, it's not just something to win an argument or something John Calvin believed, you know, it's, uh, these are biblical truths that are meant to feed your soul, mm. the teachings of grace, the, the doctrines yeah. of grace. And then another distinctive mark of Reformed theology would be covenant theology so that you're not dispensational. You you hold to the uh, that, that God's law, his moral law, is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that it hasn't changed, changed since before the foundation of the world because mm-hmm. it's an expression of God's character. Mm-hmm. And then there's what, you know, some folks use the phrase confessionally reformed. So con- where does that come from? Confessionally reformed. We sometimes say that that phrase because these things were largely sharpened these teachings were largely sharpened they weren't invented right they were sharpened and and further uh, dove into in the pro in the reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries and there's mm-hmm. a lot of confessions of faith that that came out of that era and then reformed baptist generally means a, a person or a church that subscribes to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. That's the major Reformed Baptist Confession of Faith. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention substantially subscribes to it because there's differences from folks in how closely aligned with this 1689 that you have to be (laughs) to be considered a real Reformed Baptist. It gets kind of saddening in in some of those areas where people want to, you know, wear this badge. I'm the real Reformed Baptist or whatever it is. But we think that substantial subscription is best, that you know you shouldn't be required to hold to every single word, mm-hmm. but that uh, the, the general uh, concept of every chapter is what you are actually uh, you s- subscribing to, to yes. and you may have minor exceptions. And then there's, uh, there's cultural things that some Reformed Baptists do that we don't personally think makes you a Reformed Baptist, but some people might, you know, there's been a certain culture in the past in some of these circles, certain dress types or certain songs that, that can only be sung or, or song styles, a certain language used or, or a certain decor. Um, and, and we think that being a Reformed Baptist is less about those certain cultural things as it is about um, being committed to what we were talking about before, the, the doctrines of grace, the five souls of the Reformation, and substantially mm-hmm. subscribing mm-hmm. to that 1689 confession. That's where that winsome comes in. Yes, and that's what I was talking about next year. Exactly. <laughs> we, we add this winsomely Reformed Baptist because like any type of community, there can be some who aren't super welcoming and relational, 
who, who aren't really patient. And we, we want to know how to have fun and to be warm while also knowing when it, it's time to be serious and always caring about the truth. Being both committed to the truth and committed to grace and being warm and friendly, th- those aren't at odds with one another. Yeah, oh, totally. It shouldn't be you only have one or the other. You know, oh, so there's a, you know, mega church in town and, you know, they're cool and hip and trendy and, you know, oh, but then they just, you know, don't really talk about Jesus much, you know. Right, and they don't really care about the truth. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, yeah, there, it's a beautiful thing when you can do both of those. Yep. Or you are just super... Um, you know, passionate about the truth, but then you're just only serious all the time and you never joke around and you never have a warmth or a relationality or you're not, you know, inviting people over to your home and enjoying good food and drink and mm-hmm. laughter and, um, you know, great discussion and building relationships and hospitable. Yeah, yeah just kind of like those stuff shirt people. You know, I'm sure you've met one. Yes. Um, yeah, you yeah. know, very strange people who are very you know, socially unsophisticated and, you know, to themselves and, you know, don't smile much. Um, Super uptight about everything. Yeah, but they know their Bible. Right, and they know so much about the Bible intellectually and mm. they'll, you know, tell you every last detail about it, but um, they it, it's hard for them to have any type of relational conversation and applying exactly. the, the Bible and getting to know people and getting to know their hearts and getting Amen. to know their desires and and they're you know they rarely would talk about their own sin hmm. or you know um, struggles with Christ or want to get to know yours and to be able to apply the gospel hmm. and apply the scriptures to those situations right yes it's only about doctrine nothing practical I mean just nothing you know right. very little practicals very little you know how to relate it to your heart or just get, get to your heart in general or um, just you know knowing a bunch of facts and doctrine and yeah. you know just becoming an academic uh, you know theology lecture yes type uh, type yes. setting and and even just you know there's there can be some anger in those settings you know one one of our our favorite um, folks who who we've learned so much from in the past he said you know we're reformed but not angry about it yes and that was kind of one of the taglines of being winsomely reformed mm-hmm. that um, you know once again a lot of these folks love Christ and they love Christ more than us in so many other ways and we're not and I'm more... sure they have great intentions I, yes. you know I, I don't want to say that they're all bad right and we have our own struggles and we we don't have all of this balanced down perfectly and um, we mm-hmm. we fall into um, sometimes we are angry about the truth and sometimes we we do get um, we do not handle the truth rightly, and other times mm-hmm. we don't care about the truth enough, and we fall into to people pleasing. Amen. So we sin as well in those areas. But our goal should never be to you know be okay with being someone who's non relational and who's mm-hmm. not hospitable and mm-hmm. who's not welcoming mm-hmm. and who just you know knows knows the facts of the Bible really well, but isn't but handles it um, with uh, um, without care. Amen. Yes. So we, we call ourselves winsomely reformed Baptist because it's what we believe is most biblical. Mm-hmm. Okay. We, we don't substantially subscribe to this 17th century confession of faith because it's just some tradition or it makes us mm-hmm. feel good or mm-hmm. something. We do it because we believe that it is the, the most biblical position to, to hold. We, yep. we also believe that other historic confessions of faith are very biblical. Yes. And that there are some newer confessions of faith that, that are biblical also. But we, we call ourselves winsomely Reformed Baptists because we believe it captures the, the attitude that we think we should have mm-hmm. as we hold to these truths mm-hmm. and as we try to get others to see the beautiful Christ in Amen. these biblical truths. Amen. And we, we call ourselves Reformed Baptists because we're unashamedly Reformed. We hmm. believe it's it's most biblical. We don't have to beat around the bush about that. No, you don't have to hide it or it's not, a, you know, something weird. It's a it's a beautiful, solid belief that is based from Scripture. It's true. And you're trying to you're, you're trying to help people understand what you believe is biblical when you classify mm. yourself like that instead of just saying, Oh, I'm a Christian in general. Well, you know, 
what that doesn't tell me more specifically what you believe the Bible teaches. And then we call ourselves winsomely reformed Baptists because we're not pedo Baptists like many of our reformed friends, even though we do believe in baptizing very young children if they're true believers, since scripture says that all believers mm -hmm. should be baptized. So why why do we commend this to you, winsomely reformed Baptists? Why do we commend that to you and ask you to consider possibly being that yourself. Well, first you have to see, we believe it's most biblical. Amen. And we want you to study the scriptures yes. and see if you think it's biblical as well. So it's sola scriptura. There, there's a high emphasis in reformed circles on believing and doing everything according to scripture. Hmm. It's explicitly confessional. It's actually in the, the 1689 London Baptist Confession. It's in the Westminster Confession that scripture is our highest authority. Hmm. And we have found just Reformed theology in these Reformed circles as the group of people that uphold the Bible mm -hmm. more, than, more than anyone else and actually care not only just giving lip service to being, you know, oh, we, we care about the Bible, but do you, are you actually looking in the scriptures to see what you should believe and what you should do about everything. Amen. I think that's one of the most encouraging things is when reading the 1689, the Confession of Faith, and seeing all the scriptures, I think that is what drove me even to just have a love for it and a, a, a great encouragement in it um just to see all the scripture look proofs. At where, yes look at where it's coming they, they, didn't, from. they didn't just it's make it just, up yeah it's not just like oh their own thoughts of oh yet they've had it for years and years and years but rather it's all coming from um, the word of god amen so we commend this to you because it's most biblical it, it we commend it to you because it's the most god-centered God's glory is primary because all things exist from God to God and through God. To him are all things, right? Mm -hmm. Romans mm -hmm. 11. Yes. And other theologies can so easily put man at the center. Mm -hmm. And we commend it to you because it's the most Christ-centered. Mm -hmm. it, it properly teaches that Christ is the sum of the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments. And Christ is the reason why all things exist, mm -hmm. Colossians 1. And it properly teaches that Christ is king now, and he's Lord, Savior, and treasure. Hmm. It, we commend it to you because it's the most grace-centered. The, the doctrines of grace, as we talked about before, are beautiful, mm -hmm. soul-stirring truths. Hmm. And if, if folks have preached them in the past as just you know these academic truths to know to win arguments, then that is an incorrect way to preach the doctrines of grace, mm -hmm. we should be weeping for joy and so excited and stirred in our affections for Christ mm -hmm. as we see what he has done to, uh, to, to give us new life, mm -hmm. to, to choose us apart from all of our w wicked actions and yes. everything we've ever done to rescue us. Mm, that's so good. We commend it to you because it's the most proper view of the law. Right? It emphasizes the, the threefold use of the law. The first use is to show us our sin. The second use is to restrain evil, mostly in societies. And then the third use is to provide the pathway to holiness hmm. for our joy and for God's glory. Hmm. And we commend it to you because it's the most proper view of the Old Testament. It's all foreshadowing and, and pointing to Jesus Christ. It, and it has eternal principles in the Old Testament that are relevant for, for the in the general equity of the, of the law. Amen. There's relevant principles all over the Old Testament for how we should order societies today and our own lives, and all of it ultimately points to Jesus. It's not ultimately about the physical nation mm -hmm. of Israel. Mm -hmm. it, we commend it to you because it's the most beautiful and biblical view of children, that children are not in Christ by mere birth, but they're to be brought up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Hmm. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, or 1 Corinthians 7, 14, that the children are holy in one sense by being in a believing household. It sets them apart. And, um, it, and then not shunning true faith in, in young children that exists in young children, but baptizing these children upon a profession so that they can enjoy the, the means of grace. Mm-hmm. 
we think it, it, it's, we commend it to you because it's the most biblical view of church structure, right? Biblical elders and deacons. We've learned that a lot of churches don't even have elders and deacons. Oh, yeah, that's very strange. And it's very strange and it's not biblical and it's not confessional. Mm-hmm. And it it's, has involved membership. It encourages involved membership who do the work of the ministry, Ephesians mm-hmm. 4.12. So that church staffs don't just get really huge and we just rely on these paid professionals to do most things. But it has a strong theology of church membership, which we believe is biblical, where the church members are actually involved as parts mm-hmm. of the body serving the um, serving the church. Oh, amen. I think that that's very, very good. Um, yeah, we're a body for a reason. It's not just, oh, you go to a, you know, a Sunday morning, you go to some you know, entertainment show and then... Or you're involved in a social club. Exactly, yeah. And then just go in, check in, check out. Okay, I'm done for the week. Okay, till next Mm -hmm. time. Um, Rather than wanting to serve and be a burden lifter and how can we all come together and um, and glorify the Lord through this. Right, when you're a church member, that's a huge part of your identity. Do you see that as a huge part of, of who you are, that you are in a certain family, uh, that you you know work a certain job or you are a, a mother with children and you are a husband and a wife and you're a church member of this specific church and then of course your deepest identity if you're a Christian is child of God through mm-hmm. faith in, in Jesus Christ but your church membership is extremely important and we think Reformed Baptists rightly take that very seriously mm-hmm. we, we commend it to you because it's the most beautiful and biblical view of corporate worship I think a good phrase to capture it is joyful reverence. Yes. Joyful reverence, ideally, that there is a seriousness Mm -hmm. and a joy Hmm. that should uh, guide our our corporate worship. Mm -hmm. Because so often it could just become one or the other. And this theology rightly emphasizes that there's the special presence of Christ in corporate worship, that when the church gathers... The church is actually the the temple of God. You see that multiple places in the New Testament, and in that Christ is the true temple. And when the church gathers, the church is the is the temple as well in Christ. In that Christ is manifesting Himself. That God is really among hmm. the gathered church in a special way. Yes. And it, 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 in corporate worship, they emphasize doing things according to Scripture. A lot of folks call this the regulative principle of worship. Hmm. So that that just means that. Uh, basically that all things should be done according to the word of God, that you should have biblical reasons for why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. I honestly, I mean, (laughs) obviously I believe all these because this is what we are, Right. but it's just so encouraging what each one that you're saying, because I I mean, I just completely agree with it and I agree and I love seeing so much of this or all of this in scripture and, um, and yeah, it's, it's already uh, guided out for us. So, yep. Um, how helpful is that? It is. And then usually this means with corporate worship that there's going to be a lot of explicit congregational participation, that it's not just a show because it's the mm-hmm. congregation mm-hmm. coming together as yep. the temple of God and that the Lord is meeting with the entire congregation, that it's not just a show, but everyone who is there in the congregation is involved in yes. the worship of God. Yes. And worship should be gospel-centered in structure, hmm. and uh, reform folks understand that. And um, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing when you're in a worship service that is gospel-centered in structure. There's a great video from Douglas Wilson, Doug Wilson, called "The Shape of Christian Worship" that I can link in in the show notes. Hmm. That will, if you want to look at that amazing, I think it's 18 mm. or 20 minute video that kind of shows, you know, biblically what the shape of Christian worship good. is. Yes. And then including children in corporate worship, since it is the special presence of Christ, you know, Reformed Baptists don't have these, uh, you know, other nurseries or, you know, separate children from the special presence of, of Christ. Um, but they see uh, how biblical it is and how important mm. it is to, to do that. And then we commend it to you because it beautifully respects church history without worshiping it. Amen. So it includes creeds and confessions as a regular part of of life mm-hmm. and of church life, mm-hmm. 
um, but also it just emphasizes that scripture is the the, the final authority and, and ultimate authority hmm. because that's what these confessions ultimately, they, they say it themselves. Exactly, yes. And then it includes, you know, education on on church history and just the importance of kind of seeing how rooted how important it is to recognize that you know we didn't just invent these things in our generation but Mm -hmm. we are um, folks have believed these things throughout the generations because the bible has been the same throughout generations and um, we are linked with all of the christians who have gone before us because uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so is his word. Mm -hmm. So what do we want for our fellow Reformed Baptists? What what would we say to them? Well, it's a stay committed to truth and church history. Those are wonderful things that you're committed to. Stay committed to to truth and church history. Don't sacrifice on those things. Stay Mm Christ-centered. Recognize that church history and confessions are to be greatly respected, but are never ultimate. So be hmm. committed to scripture Amen. above all. And not some not natural reason or something that, you know, you're getting from your own minds of, you know, that philosophical viewpoints of Thomas Aquinas or of of other folks. Stay true to scripture mm-hmm. in your doctrine of God, in your doctrine of the church. Keep looking to the word of God mm-hmm. for everything and don't rely on your own mind. Be committed to Christian unity. So properly recognize the difference between certain doctrines. Mm-hmm. We had one interaction with, with someone, I just say this to be a teaching moment, of, um, you know, we had been a part of another church that was just a wonderful church, and the, the preacher is more well-known, and he said, oh, you know, what, what church were you a part of before? And we said that, we said the, the church, and we said it in a positive way. We were thankful for all the wonderful things that, uh, about that church. And then the man said, oh, I've been praying that folks would leave that church because of how horrible it is and this way and That's that way and that way. And he listed these really you know tertiary things. And um, that was really saddening to us because it, it, it wasn't recognizing you know Christian unity, that you have 99% in common with this other Christian mm. pastor. Mm-hmm. And yet you're focused on the 1% of difference and kind yeah. of becoming self-righteous about that. Yeah. Um, we'd, we'd say to our other, you know, Reformed Baptist friends, brothers and sisters, learn from those who are more relational, welcoming, friendly, and socially conscious than you are. Invite folks into your home, ask questions and listen, mm-hmm. get to know them, show true interest in their lives, serve them in ways uh, other than th- than explicitly head knowledge mm-hmm. theological ways, serve them in those ways too. Yep. Uh, teach teach them the Bible, teach them what the the scriptures say, but serve them in other ways as well. You know, if they need a, a meal brought to them, or if they want to, you know, um, have someone to spend time with playing a game or something, be open to those things mm-hmm. and um, disciple them as you go. Amen. In, in a relational sense. It's not a badge of honor, once again, to be strange for strange sake, right? It's not a badge of honor just to talk strange or dress strange, have strange social cues, not look at people in the eye, for example, or whatever it is. Um, You know, Jesus, yes, we're to be different as Christians, but we're to be different in the sense that we are not sinning. Amen. Yes, we're not that to be is the difference. Yeah, we're not to just invent ways to be different just to be just for different sake. Yeah, not just never, you know, go to the store and buy new clothes or never, you know, update your house or purposely put up strange never, decorations. Never, you know, or, update your church building and just keep it, you know, very strange. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's a utilize English <laughs> from the ni- early 19th century or something uh, that that people yes. used to say. Uh, that that's not a badge of honor. No, that that's um, not allowing you to um, uh, connect with folks. It's just very small things that you could be changing mm-hmm. that could help the beautiful message and everything that that you believe is biblical to to spread um, further for the glory of God. Amen. It, it become more contextual without becoming cheesy. So mm-hmm. once again, speak the normal language. You don't have to learn the latest, you know, pop language of everything folks are saying on TikTok. That's not what we're saying. But just, you know, <laughs> speak in, speak normal language for your society and, yes. and culture. Yes. Um, emphasize beauty and art and decor. 
we should be caring about those things Mm. um, more than anyone else because we recognize the lordship of Christ over all things. And then, you know, we ask folks to consider post-millennialism. You know, of course, you have to see it in Scripture first. Don't just do it because we're, you know, we've exhorted you here. We're going to do a um, podcast one day on post-millennialism. But, but, you know, it's such a beautiful thing when you pair the truths, when you see that Scripture, I should say, pairs the truths of God's sovereignty Hmm. with the truths of God's love to save people Hmm. and his promises to save numerous people and to make so good. Uh, to make his people more than the uh, the sand and the seashore and the stars in the sky yes rather than if you think that you know god is sovereign but yet he will only save just a very small select few um it, that really changes how you live if you think you know 0.001 percent of all people who are ever living are are going to be christians and and god is sovereign over that um once again, if you think that's biblical, then you have to stick with what you believe is biblical. But, but search the scriptures because that's not what, what we believe the, the scriptures teach. And then lastly, Kyperion, um, you know, that's just about not being a dualist. Yes. Not thinking that there's this realm of, you know, spiritual things and then this realm of things that are just kind of indifferent mm-hmm. to God or these neutral mm-hmm. things. But that all things are related to Christ and all things should be done for his glory. Um, how we play sports, how we do uh, music and art and work our jobs and raise our children mm-hmm. and eat our food. Hmm. That all of these things are related to, to Christ mm, amen. and his glory. Oh, I just love all of that so much. So we are unashamedly Reformed Baptists and we hope that we are winsomely Reformed Baptist, we commend it to you as well. Study the 1689. There's a great 1689 in modern English that founders put out. I can link that as well. And um, I can recommend some uh, um, great uh, uh, Reformed Baptist uh, churches as well. There's one out in California, uh, a Christ Redeemer Reformed Church in Moreno Valley. Highly recommend checking out the, the sermons and the content that, that they're pr- putting out there, uh, uh, Pastor Martin Medina, excellent uh, Winsomely Reformed Baptist, and, and there's others as well. But we want to thank you for joining us for this episode of the Gospel Liberty Podcast.